Welcome to mini lesson 13. It's an unlucky number because now we have to do the statistical mechanics of the degenerate Fermi gas. And some of it is pretty hard. I'm not joking. I'm, uh, I'm a little bit joking because the parts that are really hard we're not even going to do. I'll try to explain some of that as we go on. <clears throat> At the end of the day, it's sort of uh, uh, some segments of this section are really topics in pretty advanced mathematical physics that I think are not where we need to be focusing our attention in PY 413. Um, so we're still in section 7.3 of Schroeder, which is a very, very long section. And in the previous mini lesson, we talked about just the quantum mechanics of the degenerate Fermi gas. And now we're going to add the statistical mechanics. So this is what we did in the last mini lesson. So we just modeled <clears throat> the degenerate Fermi gas, for example, the conduction electrons in a metal, has an ideal gas of fermions. And we solved the 3D particle in a box, and we described the states in the limit of a large number of fermions filling the states via a density of states. So this was the expression that we got. The density of states grows with energy as the square root of energy. Um, and so that looks like this blue curve here. And so rather than thinking about any individual state or set of states for the degenerate Fermi gas, what we do is we understand that we have a density of states, a continuous function. And now we're going to couple the states that are part of this continuous function to a reservoir within the grand canonical ensemble picture. And so the basic idea is that in the quantum problem, you have states below the Fermi level being occupied, states above the Fermi level being unoccupied. But when you couple this system to a thermal reservoir and let it come to thermal equilibrium, some of these occupancies will change because there'll be energy exchange between the subsystem, which is described by this density of states, and the reservoir, which is described by macroscopic temperature. And so this occupancy will no longer be just this blue curve. It will be modified by energy exchange and, and particle exchange with the reservoir. So the basic idea is that we already know for any particular energy value epsilon, the occupation probability for a fermionic level is given by the Fermi-Dirac distribution function, right? And so again, this is just what we got by coupling the subsystem of one level to a reservoir. And so this is going, this, this occupation probability for fermions is going to be relevant to every possible piece of the continuum density of electronic states that we think about for the Fermi gas, right? So the thing I want to say is that G represents asking the question, look at energy E, how many states are there? Right, And n bar represents, consider coupling the states to a thermal reservoir, what's the probability that they remain occupied under that coupling? And so you need to include both of those together. You need to say, is there a state there and is it thermally occupied? And those are two independent questions. And so what we're going to end up doing is multiplying these two things together to get the final probability of a state being occupied. Uh, based on both, both physical questions. And so the basic idea is how many subsystem states are occupied within some small energy, energy interval dE. So dN is the number of occupied s states in the small energy interval. I've messed up my notation here. <clears throat> this capital E is supposed to be uh, uh, epsilon. Right? And so the basic idea, though, is that to get this number dn, we need to multiply the electronic occupation, which is the density of states, by the thermal occupation, which is the Fermi-Dirac distribution function, right? and that's per unit energy interval. 
So the whole expression looks like this. Um, and I, I want to say that this is kind of a conceptual formula, right? We really don't do any algebra to get here. I mean, what we're doing, the derivation of this formula, is we're applying the fundamental principle of counting, which is we've got a number of states that are occupied on electronic grounds and a number of states that are occupied on thermal grounds, and the two things independently just multiplied by the fundamental principle of counting. <clears throat> so. Uh, make sure you're kind of okay that with understanding why this this works because it's a, now a general idea that we can apply anytime we've got sort of a continuum density of states and a quantum statistics situation. And in fact, it's going to end up applying not only to fermions but to bosons after the first midterm. So the way we use an expression like this is we integrate it. Um, and so if you want to calculate the number of fermions in the system, it's just the integral from zero to infinity of this whole expression, right? Integral of dn is n, right? That should be obvious. But you can also calculate averages in this way. So in some sense, this is like a, almost like a, pro a probability distribution function. In fact, it is a probability distribution function. So to get the energy, the total energy of the system, you take the little energy in the, in, in the tiny energy interval d epsilon and multiply it through by this expression and integrate over it and you get u. And so it's actually really important that this is not the same thing as u equals n e bar, right? That doesn't work in the Fermi gas right? because in some sense n doesn't make sense here. There's no, there's no fixed capital N to work with in the, in the uh, Fermi gas unless you consider the fixed capital N to be this, this integral expression, right? But it's not like it a, there's a fixed N for every subsystem. Every subsystem can potentially have a different occupancy N sub S. <clears throat> so let's talk about this situation in the limit of truly zero temperature. So in other words, let's say T equals zero Kelvin, okay? So in this case, the Fermi Dirac distribution function is a perfect step function, n bar Fd at t equals zero, um, has a chemical potential that's exactly equal to the Fermi energy. And so that's the heavy side step function at Fermi energy minus energy. And so it's one if you're below the Fermi energy, it's zero if you're above the Fermi energy. And so when you've got this heavy side step function, it makes the integrals easy to do because now instead of integrating from zero to infinity, the heavy side step function cuts you off at, uh, so this is a mistake in here. I, I meant to write a, I meant to write the upper limit as E sub F, um, but the basic idea is the heavy side step function cuts off the, the upper limit of the integral at the Fermi energy. So that's correct in this last integral and so you can evaluate this and you'll see a known relationship between the Fermi energy and the number of fermions. So check that that works and check that you know what relationship I'm talking about between the Fermi energy and the number of fermions. That's an important fundamental piece that we talked about last time. So do the same thing with the total energy. Again, the upper limit instead of being infinity is the Fermi energy. And so we can do the integral pretty easily and you get some bunch of constants times the Fermi energy to the five has power. So this looks not super easy to work with as it's sitting in front of us, but we can simplify it um, using a funny trick. So if you just go in and substitute for the system volume using the relationship between the Fermi energy and the number density, um, you actually get a whole bunch of cancellations. Do it yourself, please, to make sure that you're handy with using these formulas. And you get that the total energy of the system is just three-fifths times the number of fermions in the system times the Fermi energy. So that's a much, oopsie, I always do it. So this is a much simpler formula than this one. Um, and I guess it's important that it does sort of show you how important the Fermi energy can be, that in the limit of zero temperature, it really, this is almost U equals N bar, U equals N E bar, not quite, but it sort of has that feeling. <clears throat> 
All right. So let's keep going. Degeneracy pressure in the Fermi gas. So we have the total energy, and let's try to use it to get some other thermodynamic par parameters. Um, so let's talk about pressure. And so from the thermodynamic identity, we know that pressure equals negative partial of U with respect to volume at constant entropy and particle number. And so the question is, can we use this expression? This expression is 100% always true. The question is, with the formulas that we've developed so far, can we use this? Or would we perhaps need to develop an alternative thermodynamic potential to deal with the formulas that we have? So let's just take a look at this. U is 3 fifths N times the Fermi energy. And so definitely that's got N in it, so we can keep N constant. So since we're at t equals zero, that's an, that's an assumption, that's a limit that we're working in by assumption. Entropy by the third law has to be zero, all right? So we're sort of automatically at fixed entropy. So the only problem is that E sub F actually has some hidden variables in it that we need to pay attention to. So if we substitute in for E sub F in terms of N and V, uh, using this formula, we can actually just go ahead and respect all of the things that have to be constant and take the derivative with respect to volume so that you get a really simple result. Um, it turns out that the pressure is just two-fifths N over V times the Fermi energy. Uh, and if you substitute in for Fermi energy using this expression with uh, relating it to total energy, you get that the pressure is just two-thirds of the energy density, so the energy per unit volume. That's really interesting because this is also true for a classical ideal gas. Right? And in other words, I guess what I want to say is this is an equation of state for the degenerate Fermi gas in the limit of zero temperature. It's a really simple result and really also connects us back to things we know about classical physics. Um, you know, the only, the only distinction between classical and degenerate Fermi ideal gases is what is U. So in a, in a, in a classical ideal gas, U would have a different functional form than this 3 fifths N times the Fermi energy. <coughs> So we've got pressure, we've got total energy in the limit of zero temperature. That's pretty much all we can do at zero temperature. Um, these are really important though. Uh, you'll see in your homework um, problem a little bit of thinking about temperature in the degenerate Fermi gas um, and why it matters. It's actually particularly important astrophysically because what happens in a lot of astrophysical objects is you get sort of gravitational collapse. But if you've got a bunch of fermions that are trying to gravitationally collapse, uh, at a certain point, this pressure that just comes from essentially the Pauli exclusion principle in the degenerate Fermi gas will start to counteract the gravitational collapse. And depending on the mass that's trying to collapse, uh, you may get a white dwarf which is stabilized by the degeneracy pressure of electrons. <coughs> Golly. Just not talking well. Uh, and so this is just a picture from Wikipedia of a very well-known white dwarf called Sirius B. So it's teeny tiny little dot right here is um, a white dwarf star that is uh, known to be stabilized by this degeneracy pressure. And even in more exotic objects, where you've got a, a larger mass that can collapse more, eventually you get down to the point where you're trying to squeeze nuclei together, so in a neutron star. And there the neutron degeneracy pressure uh, will at least partly counteract the gravitational collapse. And so again, this is really a, a pure quantum effect due to Pauli exclusion, and that's why it's called degeneracy pressure. All right, <clears throat> so let's move on from zero temperature and talk about low but finite temperature. And the word finite in this context means not zero, right? So zero is infinitesimally small and 
finite here means small but not zero. So what does low mean? We always want to, if we, if we say we're at low temperature, we always need to think about what do we really mean by that? And what that question always boils down to is what energy should you compare KBT with? All right. So what energies are in the problem is the first question you can ask yourself. And in this problem, there's only one fundamental energy, and that's the Fermi energy. I mean, you know, obviously there's a whole density of states that extends from zero to infinity, but that's not a particular energy, right? That there, there are a whole bunch of states, but you need one particular energy that's characteristic of something in the system. And in this case, the only thing you have is the Fermi energy. Um, so this can be sort of challenging to think about in general, right? How do you, when you've got a new problem in front of you, how do you decide what is the characteristic energy scale? And it's not always obvious. And in fact, a lot of <clears throat> your effort and creativity may go into figuring out what is the right energy scale. But in this case, there's only one. And so low temperature always means that KVT is small enough compared to the Fermi energy. So you might say much, much less than the Fermi energy you know, to some extent, the small enough here is subject to the needs of your analysis. If you're doing a, a rough semi-quantitative analysis, it might not have to be very much smaller. And if you require five decimal places, it might have to be many orders of magnitude smaller. So another way of saying this low temperature condition is you could define a Fermi temperature, T sub F equals E sub F over KB. And then the condition is simple. The temperature needs to be much less than the Fermi temperature. And so just as an example, in copper metal, we already found that the Fermi energy was seven electron volts. And that means the Fermi temperature is something like 82,000 Kelvin. It is very hot in some sense, this Fermi temperature. Again, this is not an actual temperature of anything in copper. It's a signpost that tells you how to compare numbers. So what does it tell you? It tells you that electrons in solid copper are always in a low temperature limit, right? Because a melting point of copper is, you know, something in the range of thousand or so Kelvin. I can't remember the exact number. That's not anywhere near 82,000 Kelvin. And so the, the solid would melt before you would ever even get remotely close to the Fermi temperature of the solid, <clears throat> right? And so the melting point is actually somehow characterizing the structural stability of the solid, including uh, all of the ions. And the Fermi temperature is actually just characterizing the conduction electrons, which is a totally different story. So that's really interesting. Um, another interesting thing to think about is uh, cold atom gases, um, which it turns out have Fermi energies that are quite low. And so, in fact, cold atom gases, despite the fact that they're called cold, are way hotter from the standpoint of this analysis than even electrons in a boring old hunk of copper wire. Now, let's take a look at this plot again. So the blue curve is the is a, low, a very low temperature product of the density of states and the Fermi-Dirac distribution function. And so what happens is you have this square root growth, and then as you approach the Fermi energy, 7 eV for copper, it just cuts off the occupation completely, right? So that it goes to zero very rapidly. Sharp step. And at higher temperature, this gets smeared out. So you have square root growth, and it starts to deviate quite a bit, uh, even pretty far from the 7 eV Fermi energy and has this sort of smooth smearing across the Fermi energy. <coughs> so I made those plots on the assumption that T and mu are independent constant numbers and that there's one uh, Fermi energy equal to the chemical potential that characterizes this whole system. And that turns out to not be true. Uh, and so I'm giving you a little bit of a a different perspective on Schroeder's analysis on page 280 to 82, uh, where the claim is made that chemical potential in the Fermi gas has to depend on temperature. 
And so you almost know that this has to be true. Because if you go back to chapter three, when we first introduced chemical potential, and do the calculation for the chemical potential of a classical ideal gas, it is a function of temperature. So it's a, actually a negative number, uh, and it gets more negative as you go to higher and higher temperature, okay? I hope I wrote this right, equation 3.63 from chapter three. And so we also know that eventually a degenerate Fermi gas in the limit of small enough occupation out here um, is indistinguishable from a classical ideal gas that at some point the chemical potential has to be a function of temperature. So it means it's a function of temperature all throughout. And our next job is going to be to try to calculate uh, how to express the dependence of chemical potential on temperature. Again, in the, in the limit of very small occupation, um, you can just use the classical ideal gas formula. We're actually in some ways thinking about the limit of not so small occupation. So you do this by a special technique called the Sommerfeld expansion. Uh, and so again, this is Schroeder, page 282 to 84, if you want to actually see the steps. I'm not going to do it uh, on these slides because it's really even too boring to follow if we were in person together, honestly. But I'm also going to tell you that I'm not going to ask you to do a Sommerfeld expansion by yourself. I will ask you to use the results and be able to comment on and understand the results. So the basic idea is that at finite temperatures, the Fermi function is no longer a perfect step. You need to use the full Fermi-Dirac distribution function. <coughs> but what you do is you say, if we're still at low temperatures, in other words, temperatures significantly less than the Fermi temperature, <coughs> We can treat the Fermi function as approximately a step to help us do this integral. And that's what Schroeder does on these pages that I've indicated, is basically you approximate the Fermi-Dirac distribution function. Um, here I've just written it out fully, but, but what he does is to, is to sort of make an approximation and do a funny little <coughs> integration by part step. That equal sign shouldn't be there, so that's just a, a typo I forgot to delete. Again, you're not going to have to do this, so don't spend a lot of time worrying about it. Um, but in any case, you can evaluate this integral, and what you get is an expression that is a series expansion relationship between chemical potentials on this chemical potentials and temperatures on this side, and particle number on this side. And then what you can do is solve, use it to solve for the chemical potential. And so you get a series expression for the chemical potential. That's why it's called the Sommerfeld expansion, <clears throat> which is that the chemical potential is equal to the Fermi energy minus pi squared KBT quantity squared over the Fermi energy plus a bunch of other terms. And so this is actually already looks like a good formula because you see that in the limit of zero temperature, you recover the result that the chemical potential has to be simply equal to the Fermi energy. And then you see that it decreases as you increase the temperature. That's important because remember, we need it to match with the classical gas prediction at very high temperatures when the occupations are quite low, right? So um, eventually you can imagine as the temperature increases, this term becomes more and more dominant and you would approach a, a negative and decreasing value. Okay, so you can do the same kind of trick. So here I didn't mess up with my equal signs um, to calculate the influence of this temperature dependent chemical potential on the total energy. So you do kind of the same thing. U is equal to this expression, but now you have to do the whole integral. And so you need to essentially do like a series expansion of the Fermi-Dirac distribution function. So you do the series expansion, and then you note that there's also a series expansion expression for mu. So it's like a double series expansion. <clears throat> but the end result is not so bad. You, you again end up with a series, right? But the total energy is 3 fifths N E sub F. That should look familiar. That's the zero temperature limit. 
And then the correction term shows internal energy increasing as a function of temperature. And you usually wouldn't take any, any higher terms than the one that's kBt squared. <clears throat> so this is nice because it actually gives us something that we can very easily test against experiment. What you can do is from the total energy U is to calculate the constant volume heat capacity. Make sure that's something easy for you. That's something that I expect to be super duper easy is if you're given U as a function of T, you can calculate C sub V, all right? Um, and so what you get here is that C sub V is proportional to temperature. You can go in and directly measure the low temperature specific heat of metals um, and find that this is indeed true. And this is one of the best evidences that we have that um, the degenerate Fermi gas treated as an ideal gas of fermions is actually a good model for a lot of properties of solids. So you actually see this uh, this, this T linear specific heat is a really important characteristic of many, many solids. All right. <clears throat> so yeah, you don't have to do the Sommerfeld expansion, any of this junk on these lines, um, but you do have to be able to understand the meaning and use of the expressions that result. All right. So this is basically... Uh, the end of new material that we're going to do for midterm two. Uh, I'll say more about that in like a vlog video uh, later in the week or maybe early next week. Um, the test is May 10th, so about 10 days from now. It will cover all of this material, uh, but no more in chapter seven. When we come back from midterm two, we'll finish chapter seven and that will be on the final exam. So we'll see you next time.